Exterior, late afternoon. A church in the middle of a small town in war-torn World War II Italy. Explosions go off in the distance. Nurse number one pushes past soldiers and throngs of people to make it inside. Interior, church. The pews have been pushed to the side to make room for cots holding injured allied troops. Nurse number one moves with purpose down the rows of cots organized for triage, with the injuries getting more and more severe as she goes. Nurses number two and three stop their work with patients and look up hopefully at nurse number one. The dread and despair on her face make it clear, however, that there is no good news to share. She beckons the other two nurses over to an area out of earshot of the patients. There was no drop. I made it to the site and that's when the bombing started. I dove for cover and peeked out to see all of our morphine, antibiotics, emergency, sur emergency surgery supplies, bandages and gauze gone up in an instant. Gone. But what are we going to... Gone. Exterior. Sunset. Behind the church. The three nurses stand together smoking cigarettes, watching the sunset orange and red on the day. Unsure of how they'll get their patients through the next day or even the night, they spend this moment of calm together before the final storm, like a last meal. A farewell song, like a regiment that knows it's outnumbered, surrounded and facing certain death, they feel a strange temporary peace. Nurse one, why don't we just leave? There's nothing we can do to help these men. Nurse number two, what can three women do in the midst of all this madness? This task is impossible. How can anyone create healing when everyone in the world is so intent on burning everything to the ground? She remembers what her uncle used to say when she'd try and save an injured animal back home on the farm in Montana. Honey, healing is like a three-titted unicorn running through the woods and flying over the mountains that everyone is searching for but no one ever finds. <laughs> She thinks of sharing the story, but decides that it would ruin the gravity of the moment. <laughs> Nurse number three, I'm not going anywhere. I don't know what I'm going to do, but we've got to do something. She flashes back to her childhood, tagging along with her dad, barnstorming with the traveling medicine show. She'd watch him pour any bath liquid into a small brown bottle and tout about its wondrous abilities to cure warts, reverse, reverse blindness, or regrow lost teeth. Hurry, hurry, step right up, not a moment to waste. We got potions about the pound and baskets and bales of snake oils and salves to cure what ails you. When she asked her dad why he lied, he said, honey, these people know the game. But just being near someone saying the word healing makes them feel better. They walk out of our tent with a spring in their step like, maybe this guy's telling the truth and that hope is worth the few bucks they shell out. They walk out of here healed. And hell, we all need that. Healing is maybe the second oldest profession in the world after prostitution. Wait, it's the oldest profession too. Tell me of a single man who complains about his arthritis or his cough when he's knee deep in a woman's warmth, her legs wrapped around him, squeezing out any other thoughts other than ecstasy. And tell me, how's he going to focus on fist fighting a cold with his fist full of two life-giving breasts? Voila! <laughs> she looks out on the Italian town, turning from majesty to rubble, and she still feels like his young girl. A fact that's betrayed by her arms covered with tattoos from countless nights with the carnival. The most ironic of which is a tattoo on her wrist that reads, Always act like a lady. <laughs> nurse number three jumps to her feet and walks back into the church with such purpose that nurse number one and two jump up and follow her without even really knowing why. Nurse number three walks to the back of the church, to the triage unit with the worst injuries and looks down at the face of this one soldier wishing she had some hope to sell him. She leans down and kisses him fully on the mouth bringing wetness to his dusty dry lips and nurse number one and two see a calm pass over his face. It starts innocently enough. Into the night, the nurses go through the rows, kissing the terminally ill patients. Tense face after tense face relaxes into calm. In the morning, things get more complicated. The injuries are unbearable, but not fatal. If another drop of supplies could come soon, these men could make it. The nurses have to distract them somehow. Nurse number three comes upon a patient with a bad bullet wound to the leg and leans over to inspect the wound, accidentally burying his face in her breasts. <laughs> All three of the nurses see the soldiers stand at attention, in a manner of speaking. It's clear what they have to do. They cover the cross in the back of the church and get back to work with a newfound purpose. Patient interviews turn to urgent inquiries of turn-ons and turn-offs. Soldier shirts get ripped off and licked fingers, circle nipples, tongues slide into ears. Soldiers that can manage to lift their arms slide them up the insides of nurse uniforms and squeeze awaiting breasts. Those that can't lift their arms up so high get help from the nurses to slide their hands up thighs to feel the wet warmth of a true American hero.
<laughs> Down the aisle, nurse number two is bent over the lap of a soldier with a badly broken left arm who slides up her skirt and spanks her ass with his good right arm. <laughs> nurse number one goes into overdrive, riding one patient and servicing the servicemen on either side of her with her hands. Nurse number two and nurse number three notice her and have an epiphany. With a little creativity, they can go even faster down the rows. They move all, they move all of the soldiers with foot fetishes to one side of the room, spread out evenly so they can each do a hand job, blow job, hand job, and foot job all at the same time. The church is filled with as many moans as it was the day before, but now of a different kind. Not a single soldier loses their life that day. But soon, the novelty starts to wear off and the nurses dive into the soldiers' deeper fetishes as they surface. Nurse number one has two patients lying head to head on their backs and bounces back and forth face sitting on each of them, spanking two and giving stern masturbations instructions to an attentive eager man in the corner. <laughs> Nurse number two has made a makeshift dildo out of a gas mask and a flashlight and is ass fucking one patient while pulling around two others on leashes fashioned from shoestrings. As nurse number three is jerking one patient off onto the chest of two others, she takes a wistful look at the, two, at the tattoo on her wrist and starts fisting another patient. As she continues, we see the tattoo on her wrist read, always act like a lady, always act like a, always act like a, always act like a lady, always act, always act like a lady, always, always act like a lady, nothing. Again, no one dies, and stories travel far and wide, and soldiers start faking injuries to be able to go to this hospital. Soon, active soldiers from the opposing side start, def start defecting to come to this hospital with the magic nurses, so there are two lines at the door with men in opposing uniforms. It doesn't take long before the war ends, because no soldiers are left willing to fight, and the world finally knows peace and healing. Years later, Marvin Gaye learns of the exploits of these three brave women, and in an inspired trance writes the lyrics for sexual healing. A number of years after that, in October, a small group of Israeli and Palestinian nurses find the journal of nurse number three and have an epiphany. Blackout. <laughs>